today is the first of our three webinars on ADA. Um, the next uh, in the series will be held on September 14th. And that is on, I think they're both on Tuesday, correct, Jennifer? Correct. They're both Tuesdays. Um, and the next one will be website accessibility and reservation policies. That'll be at 2 p.m. Eastern time again. And then the final and third one will be October 19th. And that is disability etiquette, communicating effectively and respectfully with guests with disabilities. Once again, at 2 p.m. on October the 19th. Uh, don't worry, uh, we will be sending out emails. You don't have to remember that. And we will prod you many times asking you to register for that also. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand this off to Jennifer Lynn Perry. Um, and she's going to teach you a lot about ADA. So thanks, Jennifer. Oh, thank you very much, Gary. And thank you to Bridget as well. Thanks for asking me to, to join you all today. Um, I think, Gary, I also want to mention if, if people wanted to turn on their captions, at, the, at least on the top of, of my screen, there's the three dots, the ellipse. If you click on that, there's an option you'll see to turn on live captions. So if anyone needs that feature, um, feel free to, to turn that on. Uh, so welcome again. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, our focus today is going to be more on the physical accessibility side of things. And then, as Gary mentioned, we'll delve into some other topics uh, um, when we meet in September and again in October. But right off the bat, I'm required to let you know um, I work for the Northeast ADA Center, which is housed at Cornell University, uh, specifically within the ILR school and the Yang Tan Institute on Employment and Disability. But the Northeast ADA Center is a grant funded project and we're funded by the a National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. I am not an attorney and I am not permitted to, nor can I provide legal advice. So I have to let you know that the information that we're discussing today uh, should not be construed as legal advice. And this is my contact information and Gary and Bridget, I'm happy to send you both a PDF of the slides that I'm using. So if you want to um, attach them to go along with the webinar archive, you can feel free to do so. So I'll send you that PDF um, when we're finished today. Um, but you will also, if you have access to that, have my, my contact information, which I've shared here. Um, as I mentioned, I work for Cornell uh, within the Yang Tan Institute on Employment and Disability. Um, which is obviously housed on Cornell's campus in Ithaca, but I happen to work from a home office. Um, so I'm talking to you today from New Jersey, uh, from, my, from my office there. So my email is J is in Jennifer, L is in Larry, P is in Peter, 359 at cornell.edu, should you ever want to email me any questions in the future. And my direct number is the 732-449-3621 number. You can feel free to to reach out to me. Now, I know that some people watching this webinar might be located in other areas of the country um, beyond the territory that the Northeast ADA Center covers, uh, which includes New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. But the good news is if you call that 1-800 number that you also see here, 949-4232, you will automatically be routed to the ADA Center that serves your region. Um, we all share the same 800 number and based on your area code, you get directed to the ADA Center in your area. So um, also I'm happy to help, uh, but you can also you know, feel free to use that 800 number to talk to somebody uh, local if you have questions in the future. So there's the 1-800 number again. Um, and, and what all the ADA centers do, not just ours, but all the ADA centers are funded um, to provide training and programs like today's, as well as technical assistance to any and all stakeholders with questions about the ADA. Uh, we are not advocacy organizations, so we do not provide advocacy assistance. Um, we provide information. Um, and we also provide confidential technical assistance. So as you'll hear in a moment, you know, none of the ADA centers, we do not enforce the law. You know, that, that lies in the hands of several federal agencies that I'll mention uh, momentarily, but we do provide information um, and try to educate, as I mentioned, any and all stakeholders who have questions about the ADA. So you can email us, you certainly can visit our website or give us a call if you have questions in the future. So we're gonna start real basic with what is the ADA? 
Uh, last month, we celebrated on July 26th, the 31st anniversary of the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And despite it being, you know, 30 plus years old, on that technical assistance line I just mentioned that we staffed Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30, uh, we still get calls every day from people who frankly just don't quite understand how the ADA works, who it applies to, where it applies, how it's enforced. Uh, so I just wanted to stress to, to everyone that it is a federal civil rights law. Um, and it was signed into law in 1990. It was amended in 2008 and the 2008 amendments really just kind of strengthened the definition of who was protected under the ADA because during that time period um, between the early 90s and 2008, uh, there were some decisions made by the Supreme Court that um, narrowly interpreted who was a person with a disability as defined in the ADA. And that was never the intent of Congress. Congress's intent was that it would be a very broad definition um, of who was protected. Uh, so that Amendments Act did not weaken, in fact, it actually strengthened um, who was protected under the law. And the purpose of the ADA is to provide equal opportunity and equal access for people with disabilities. So those are the, the main you know, purpose, if you will, of the ADA. But as I mentioned, we get so many calls on our TA line, we've also learned what a lot of people think the ADA is, and it, it clearly is not. So the ADA is not an agency. Remember, it's a federal civil rights law, nor is it a social service program. So it has absolutely no connection whatsoever to social security disability or other types of federal uh, benefit programs. There's obviously no funding associated with the ADA and there's no need to register. You know, it's, it's again, it's a civil rights law. So if you are an individual with a disability, you are protected. Your civil rights are protected under this law. And the ADA is not the cure-all, if you will, to every uh, disability injustice that people call us about. And that's some of those calls are the hardest that we have to handle. Um, but unfortunately, the ADA is an incredibly comprehensive civil rights law, but there are a lot of issues that frankly just still are not addressed um, within the ADA. So we have to be very clear to educate people. Um, or the ADA, the law just frankly is, is not the law that can help them with their particular uh, problem that they're experiencing. Now, the ADA, as many of you, you know, who, who've been around since 1990, the ADA has certainly impacted everything, you know, from our built environment to how we develop and deliver programs and services. It's impacted, you know, recreation, transportation, how we communicate. Um, employment, it, it's, it's impacted so many areas of our lives. So um, many people, particularly the younger generation, are very much used to, you know, the ADA world, if you will. For those of us who are older, we certainly have seen some major changes and shifts, um, not only in the built environment, which were, of course there had been many, um, but in other areas as well. So the ADA has, certainly has impacted many areas. And where the ADA applies, are reflected in what are known as the five titles of the law that you see here. So Congress, when they drafted the law, they knew there were several key considerations, key areas where people with disabilities needed equal access. And the first area that they addressed was employment. So that's title one, employment. Um, you know, if you don't have the ability to, to earn a living, it's, it's very hard obviously, you know, to, to be successful. So Congress recognized that people with disabilities need to be protected from disability discrimination um, in employment. So that's reflected in Title I. And we don't have time today to get too much into the details there, um, but this is the part of the ADA that protects, you have to be a qualified individual with a disability, but if you're discriminated against based on your disability, you do have rights under Title I of the ADA. And all of the employment provisions are enforced by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. That's who enforces all of the employment stuff. Now, Title II of the ADA applies to all state and local government entities, as well as any subdivisions you know, of a state or local government entity. And this is the part of the law that requires both physical accessibility as well as program accessibility. So any programs or services that are offered, and that would include things like public education, public transportation, 
uh, the ability to go and vote on election day, uh, rec you know, recreation, your local parks. Those are just some examples of things that would fall under Title II of the ADA. Um, and there's some joint enforcement here between the United States Department of Justice and in the case of public transportation, uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation has oversight. So that would apply to things like your paratransit system, your fixed route bus system, and even uh, private transportation carriers as well. And then Title III. Um, there's a big red arrow there because this is what applies to hotels and motels. Um, and this is the part of the ADA that requires access in public accommodations. And what's required is, again, equal access, um, including both physical as well as program accessibility in places such as restaurants, hotels, stores, uh, places of business. And the U.S. Department of Justice is the primary enforcement agency uh, for Title III. And then Title IV requires access to telecommunications. So this it requires a closed captioning on certain television programming, as well as the uh, TTY system, which is what enables individuals who are deaf to communicate um, with people who are speaking through the phone system by using a relay operator to convey those messages. And the FCC primarily enforces the uh, provisions of Title IV, and in some cases, the Department of Justice does. And then Title V has, you know, what are called the miscellaneous provisions, but one of the biggest is protecting the rights of individuals with disabilities if they are retaliated against for trying to uh, enforce their rights under the ADA. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to pause. Did, does anyone have any questions before I keep soldiering on here? I guess you can raise your hand if you do. OK, not seeing any, so I'm going to continue on. Um, but I, I should mention, when you look at these five titles, I mentioned you know, the importance of employment. Everyone understands you know, the, the importance of being able to have gainful employment, um, how important that is for people with disabilities. And Congress recognized in Title II you know, things like the ability to get an education, the ability to go and vote, having that, that equal access to civic life was part of you know, very, very key to, to American society. And then the ability to enjoy the freedoms that many of us do, like going to um, out to eat or going to a ball game or going to the movies or staying at a hotel. Um, those things are recognized in Title III. And then, of course, telecommunications. So the, the law is comprehensive and tries to hit on a lot of areas um, and ensure equal access for people with disabilities. So how is it enforced? So we're going to focus on Title III because that's what would apply to, to those attending today. Um, individuals can now uh, file a complaint if you feel you've been discriminated against under the ADA. Um, there is an online complaint form that can be completed. It's on the Department of Justice's ADA website, which is at ada.gov. People also have an option of filing a private lawsuit and that will be done in federal court because the ADA is, of course, a federal civil rights law. And sometimes the Department of Justice um, recommends alternative dispute resolution, resolution, including mediation, going through a mediation process. So those are the primary ways um, that people can enforce their rights if they choose to under the ADA. So note that it is not a law, a law that's enforced uh, locally um, because it is a civil rights law, so um, it is not enforced by any kind of local officials. Now, under Title II, state and local governments have an obligation to comply with the ADA. So usually they have set towns and cities have what's known as an ADA coordinator, supposed to be a point person to help um, address concerns that residents you know, may have related to the ADA or to accessibility. Um, but even if they do, if someone chose to, even under Title II, they could go and file a, a complaint online at ada.gov uh, or do the same thing, hire a lawsuit. Excuse me, file a lawsuit. So as I mentioned, uh, places of lodging are one of the 12 categories of areas that are covered under the ADA and classified as a place of public accommodation. So lodging, 
very clearly is going to, to cover hotels and motels. And a place of public accommodation falls under the other categories that you can see on the slide here. Um, and usually these places in some way, shape or form affect commerce and, you know, include things like what you see, recreation, education, social services, service delivery, public gatherings, entertainment. These are all considered uh, places of public accommodation. Now, if you are a place of public accommodation, these are the general requirements, if you will, uh, that come into play um, because of Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act. First one is uh, non-discrimination. So basically having a policy of providing equal access to whatever your goods or services are that you're selling, providing equal access to people with disabilities as you do to uh, people without uh, disabilities. It also includes an obligation to reasonably modify your policies and your practices. And your policies and practices are on, on a daily basis, probably those things that you do that you, you, you wouldn't consider this is our policy or our practice, um, but being willing to modify how you normally do things if necessary to aid somebody uh, with a disability. And one of the most common examples of a reasonable modification of a policy is uh, service animals. Um, you very likely may have a no pets policy, but I'm sure you're all familiar by now that you have to be willing to modify that no pets policy uh, to permit someone who has a service dog um, if they come and want to stay um, at your hotel. So that's a very classic example of a, a modification of a policy. You also have to provide auxiliary aids and services if needed to ensure effective communication with people with disabilities. And auxiliary aids and services is, is kind of a fancy term, but it, it can cover anything from if somebody who is deaf arrives, um, being willing to exchange written notes back and forth in order to communicate. It can also be something um, as simple as providing information about your property in you know blown up in large print for somebody who perhaps has low vision um, and is un unable to read fine print it can also include you know things like assisted listening devices uh, particularly if you have um, some type of uh, banquet room or something you meeting rooms that you rent out um, those types of uh, listening devices to amplify sound for people who may have uh, hearing disabilities there's also, of course, architectural accessibility and the obligation to remove barriers uh, if it's readily achievable for you to do so. And we're going to talk a lot about that as we uh, go on here today. But this is kind of in a nutshell, a really good overview of the general requirements um, that would apply to, to all places of public accommodation. Now, we get this question a lot, you know, what happens if you have a landlord tenant relationship where somebody is just leasing space uh, from a property owner? I think we have a question. Um, Gary, is no, that a it was question? Just, it was somebody just <laughs> signing on. So I oh, just I'm admitted. sorry. Hey, yeah, this is you. How are you? Hi, Sunday. Hi, hi. You're okay. good. So the um, landlord tenant under the ADA, I just want to be clear, both landlords and tenants are equally responsible for meeting their obligations under the ADA. So there is no, the, the ADA doesn't say, well, if you're just a tenant in a building, you don't have any obligations, that all lies on the owner. The Department of Justice is very clear that they consider both the landlord and the tenant to equally have obligations under the law. Having said that, if between the two parties, meaning the landlord and the tenant, if they want to, um, in their contract or in their lease, have language that makes it clear who is responsible, particularly financially, uh, for any accessibility modifications, that's fine. But that contract is merely a contract between the landlord and the tenant. God forbid an ADA complaint were filed, both the landlord and the tenant would, would be named in that complaint. Um, because, as I said, they both have obligations. As the complaint played out, you know, contractually, whatever that lease says between the landlord and the tenant, that would just kind of play out separately, if that makes sense. Um, but under the ADA, they, they still both, both parties have obligations uh, to, to comply with Title III of the ADA. <coughs> I'm sorry, you guys, I have a tickle in my throat. 
since you have a tickle, I'm going to take this opportunity to ask you a couple of questions on things sure. that you said, Jennifer. Uh, sure. So on on this point here, um, a lot of our hotels being economy hotels do have long term guests and based on their local laws, um, depending how long that guest stays, they then become a tenant. Mm. Um, do you have any suggestions or feedback on how this could affect that that relationship? <clears throat> that is it's a loaded question. I know. It, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, it, no, it's an extremely loaded question because there's so many things running through my mind. So, particularly if these long term no, instead of hotel guests, they become tenants. You said. Yeah, by law, like mo I believe in Texas, if they stay more than 28 or 30 days 30, um, yeah. as a long term guest, you know, an extended stay guest, they then become a tenant okay. and have to go through eviction processes and stuff like that. So they they basically become a tenant. Are they subsidized by the some kind of local government or is, is there? S sometimes they are. Sometimes they are. It, it I mean, some people, it's just what they can afford to stay in the economy hotels long term. So right. that's their permanent housing solution. And sometimes, you know, it may be subsidized or other times it might just be somebody that's working. You know, sometimes we have crews that stay at hotels, you know, oil workers, things like that down in right. Texas, especially where they may be there for two or three months. Right. So that absolutely does get tricky because typically the ADA um, requirements we refer to transient lodging, right? It's meant to be transient in nature. Usually anything 30 days or more is is you know no longer considered transient. It's more con more residential. When you have ex particularly extended stay hotels, um, they have additional obligations to comply not only with the ADA if they have short term rooms, but if they also accommodate longer term, 30 days or more, they then have to comply with another law called the Fair Housing Act. Um, it's a similar law to the ADA, but it applies strictly in residential settings. So if you have uh, a facility where you have both transient or short term stays as well as longer term, we'll use 30 days or more because most people consider that to be the, the logical cut off between transient and residential, um, then you could have both laws applying. Um, under the Fair Housing Act, there's a whole different set of design and construction requirements, but they only apply to facilities that were built after March of 1991. But there are still obligations to provide what are known as reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications of your policies, like I just mentioned, uh, for tenants um, that are staying there that are going to look a lot like everything we're talking about under the ADA. Um, so for those for those longer stay tenants, uh, there is just be aware that there is additional obligations potentially under the Fair Housing Act. And if um, any kind of local government or town or city is providing, you know, let's say vouchers or something of that nature for people that are displaced, then in addition to that, the city has obligations to make sure that they are contracting with uh, accessible facilities as well. If they're, you know, funding um, people with disabilities to help find housing in emergency situations, then they have an obligation as well um, to make sure that they are doing their part to provide access for people with disabilities. So there's a whole lot in that question. Um, and if anyone has, you know, needs to talk through that more, I'm happy to. You can always give me a call. But that is. Um, certainly a, a more intricate area. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> sure. OK, so landlord tenant um, now in terms of physical accessibility, the ADA design requirements that are currently in effect um, are known as the 2010 ADA standards for, for accessible design, and they have been in effect since March 15th of 2012. For facilities that were built prior to that, specifically between January of 1993 and March 15th of 2012, there was the older set of design standards referred to as ADAG. Um, so those were those applied again from 93 to 2012. And then in addition to the ADA standards for design that people have to comply with, um, there's also your local jurisdictions um, building code. So if you are doing any kind of renovations or new construction alterations, uh, your <coughs> local building code 
is very likely also going to apply. So you always want to double check and make sure that your local um, code is it more restrictive than meaning require, requiring a higher level of accessibility uh, than what's required by the ADA. So you just always want to be when it comes to physical accessibility, you always want to, to double check that. And that's where your ADA centers can be of assistance. If you weren't sure, you could always contact your local ADA center and they can help you with that. <clears throat> so remember, um, because the ADA is a federal law, if you are doing renovations uh, to your site or to your facility, and you do get, you know, a, a local inspector comes out and says you're good. Here's your paperwork. We're going to sign off. You get your certificate of occupancy. <laughs> Just remember that those um, building officials, they are charged with enforcing their local building code. They do not enforce the ADA. So while they may sign off on the accessibility requirements in the building code, they are not giving you any kind of document that states that you are, are, are meeting your federal law obligations, you know, under the ADA. So some people get um, confused by that and they think they're the same thing when in essence they are not. Uh, but the good news is that most building codes throughout the country, and I can for sure here in the Northeast region, um, people have worked very, very hard to ensure that the building codes at a, it contain for accessibility the minimum standards of the ADA. In many cases, they actually exceed what's required by the ADA. So if you do any kind of new construction or alterations and you comply with the building code from an accessibility perspective, you should be covered under the ADA. It shouldn't be an issue, but it's always worth checking um, just to make sure. OK, so this is I know um, I've talked with Gary and with Bridget, and I know this has been a source of confusion. So I just wanted to, to mention it. And if anyone has questions, I'm happy to entertain them. But there, there is a, a misconception that older buildings are somehow grandfathered in under the ADA. And I think this miscon misconception is what has led to a number of um, ADA complaints. So the reason no one's grandfathered under the ADA is because Title III entities, which again, remember, includes places of lodging, as well as places like restaurants and other businesses as well, have had an obligation since 1993 to remove barriers to accessibility if it is readily achievable for that particular business to do so. Readily achievable is determined is excuse me defined as easily accomplishable and without much difficulty or expense. It's very much a sliding scale. So I always use the example of what's readily achievable for for Bill Gates if there's two steps at one of his buildings compared to the mom and pop pharmacy if they have two steps at their business. Obviously their resources are going to be drastically different. I think it'd be really hard for Bill Gates to say. I can't afford to put a ramp over two steps in my building, but for that mom and pop pharmacy, for those owners, it, it may it may not be readily achievable for them. It may be that it is. I don't know, but um, certainly cost, um, the nature of the barrier comes into play, and so do the financial resources of the particular business. So my point is you have this ongoing obligation to look at any barriers to accessibility and determine if it is easily accomplishable without much difficulty or expense for you to remove those barriers. It may be that instead of two steps, uh, there's 15 steps, which is going to not only be much more expensive, but it's also going to be a much bigger barrier that frankly might become almost technically infeasible to overcome. That's going to be a really, really long ramp um, or a lift you know, to overcome that barrier. So at that point, it might not be easily accomplishable without much difficulty or expense. And you're not expected under the ADA to have to take that kind of action, you know, if it's not readily achievable. But there is no blanket exception. And that's where I think people get hung up. So based on the age of your building, people think, well, I was built prior to 1990 or to 1993, so I don't have to make any improvements. Or some people think I don't have to do anything until I actually alter the building. Which is true. When you alter the building, you you absolutely are going to pick up requirements to improve access. But even if you don't, because of this language here, you still have obligations to remove barriers if it's readily achievable to do so. And this is an ongoing obligation, and it's also an obligation that has been in place uh, since 1993. So again, 31 years now. Uh, was there a question, Penny? Uh, yes. Um, 
so some of the things that I run across, uh, you know, I have the older buildings, we all do, but I seem to have a lot of them in the Northeast. And some of their problems are, let's say, uh, the wider bathroom door. And they have like a, I don't know, maybe it's a 30 inch or so. And it's in a situation where they'd actually have to move a whole wall out to make that door wider. So I know you're saying that it's an ongoing situation for them to update, but if they prove that there's no way I can do this without reconstructing my room, my bathroom, let's say, Mm -hmm. do they eventually have to do it or can they just, that has to be taken off the table. Like they just can't widen that door. Cause that's a common one. It, it kind of it kind of depends. So, and we're we're going to get into this a little bit as as we uh-huh. as we go through. But if a let's say if all if they're not doing any alterations to that bathroom, all they want to do is make the door wider. Right. But there's a load bearing wall that they can't do it. That would very likely probably not be considered uh, readily achievable okay. if that's all they're doing. But if the day comes where they're going in and renovating the bathrooms and there's more significant work being done and now it's an alteration now you're not just being held to the barrier removal standard sure. but now you're engaging in an alteration at that point in time um there certainly will be a higher expectation to to improve that issue maybe there's use of a pocket door or something else that could be done um you know to to try to improve access um and this is just a part two to that question because some guys might might want to hear this so let's suppose this happens today and i'm getting slammed with the northeast with the uh people coming out and trying to sue everybody so if say they run into one of those situations with that situation like the door not being wide enough in the back um in a court how does how does how do they look at that I mean, are they, do they throw that, I mean, and it's hard for you to answer that, but if that was the only issue, the bathroom is definitely not handicap accessible. So that means the room is not, does that get thrown out? Well, if the room isn't, isn't an accessible room, then there, there shouldn't be a, if they can't file an ADA complaint over a room that's not an accessible room. So I would think that would not have any, any merit, um, but but unfortunately, anyone can file a complaint. You know, yeah. anyone can file a lawsuit. Um, and different courts and different districts have kind of ruled differently. Now, like I said, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an attorney, so I'm really not permitted to provide legal advice. But I, I can tell you if, if that was the only complaint, and there have been some districts that have looked at um, uh, serial plaintiffs, meaning plaintiffs that have filed numerous lawsuits, Mm-hmm. Um, certain districts have um, absolutely done that, dismissed some of those cases, but that 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 doesn't always happen. I would say the best defense, though, uh, for somebody in that situation who, um, as part of their barrier removal efforts, it's not readily achievable to 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 get rid of a barrier. The best defense would be to have some kind of documentation of what the barrier is, the fact that you had a contractor or somebody come yes. out or an architect and tell you this is what it would cost, this is why we can't do it. Uh-huh. Um, and that would kind of be the best defense that you could possibly be prepared with uh, should okay. that complaint come your way. I've actually told them that. I think we were told that during the chairlift days that if you can prove it's sort of a financial hardship to research the pricing put it in a folder in your file and keep it there until god forbid something happens but that's what i do too okay thanks yeah sure okay so we're gonna we're gonna talk about this a little bit more so so when you're trying to figure out what is what is not readily achievable when you're looking at all these barriers to accessibility though some of the things you want to consider again are the nature of the barrier and the cost um, to eliminate that barrier also the overall financial resources of the organization or of any parent organization so going back to that landlord tenant maybe a franchisee relationship um, depending on the overall financial resources particularly of any kind of parent organization or entity 
um, those come into consideration in, in determining whether or not barriers are readily achievable. You also want to think about what will the impact be, particularly if you have to engage in some kind of construction on your resources and your operations. You know, is it going to um, are you going to lose revenue if you have to go in and make some of these changes or are there some changes that yes are going to impact you but maybe for one afternoon or for two days um, as opposed to other changes that might force you to have to lose uh, the ability of a room for a week or for two weeks um, which is going to have a significant impact on your operations as well as your income so uh, those are all things that you absolutely should take into consideration when trying to determine whether or not barriers are readily achievable or not and document um, those those items as well. I would highly recommend doing that. And you also want to consider safety um, when you are addressing accessibility improvements. Are they going to be done in a way that is safe for for everybody, including, of course, those with disabilities? Um, I would just caution you not to not to stereotype perhaps um, or to consider what is or is not safe. Make sure that you actually have trusted um, input and resources from professionals um, that can attest to whether or not certain improvements are going to be a threat. Um, to, to when, If you're going to use safety as a, as a defense, you want to make sure that you can properly document that 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 is why you're 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 not removing a barrier. So the Department of Justice has said in these older buildings, and remember, when we talk about barrier removal, these requirements apply to buildings that were built prior to 1993. If your building was either built after 1993, or if you have um, rooms or toilet rooms that were altered after 1993, the expectation is that they already comply with ADA standards. If they don't, then that's just considered an, an ongoing violation because they should have. Um, but for those buildings that were around before the ADA was signed into law, this readily achievable barrier removal is what applies. And the logic is that incrementally over time, small improvements are made to provide greater access, not perfect access, but greater access uh, for people uh, with disabilities. So the Department of Justice said, if you're looking around your hotel, maybe it was built in you know, the 70s and there are some issues and you want to address some of them, but you don't know where to start. Um, the Department of Justice says you always want to start with how, you know, looking at how do people get here. You know, so that includes your accessible approach as well as the entrance uh, to the building. Accessible approach would be looking at, you know, maybe you have a parking lot, maybe there's a public transportation stop or a public sidewalk. You want to look at how people are getting to through your front door um, and then the front door itself. That would be your, your first priority to improve access to. Second would be the areas where your goods and services are made available. So in the case of most um, hotels and motels, it's probably going to be your guest rooms. Um, and then if you have any other amenities like meeting rooms or conference rooms, uh, those would also uh, fall into that category. And then um, access to restroom facilities or toilet rooms if they're provided. That's kind of the third priority where you can look to remove barriers. And then if all you have are some old drinking fountains or some old public telephone booths, um, those are kind of last on the list. But th that's what you could address if everything else was already accessible. Um, those are the things that you would want to address and see if there's any accessibility improvements that can be made. So those are the priorities that the Department of Justice has shared. And here's just some examples of things that can be done that DOJ, the Department of Justice, um, considers as common examples of barrier removal steps. Um, and they include things like installing ramps, widening doorways, um, changing out you know, door hardware, perhaps with lever hardware, um, creating accessible parking spaces, even rearranging furniture to provide for an accessible route, installing strobe alarms, the flashing alarm lights, providing curb cuts, installing grab bars in your toilet stalls. So these are just some, you know, there, there's others, but those are some of the more common examples that DOJ considers uh, to be uh, examples of readily achievable barrier removal. Now I wanted to compare um, those things, readily achievable barrier removal with alterations. So 
as part of your barrier removal plan, if you want to go in and install grab bars in a toilet stall, you don't have uh, the resources to, to gut the toilet room and to make it fully compliant. All you're going to do is install grab bars, but be aware that you still have to comply with the ADA standards for design when you install them. So that means um, looking at the standards, making sure you have the proper length, the proper height, you know, one grab bar to the rear of the toilet, one along the sidewall, um, you know, one and a half inches between the gripping surface and the wall. So all those technical requirements, even if you're just doing barrier removal, are still going to apply for those features that you're addressing. So in this case, if, if all you're doing is installing grab bars, you want to make sure that those grab bars comply uh, with the ADA standards for design. When you are doing an actual alteration to a facility, which is part of a larger scale project, technically an alteration is defined as a change that affects the usability of a space. Um, the ADA standards are, are certainly going to apply in that instance as well. So I wanted to. I'm actually going to come back to this slide, guys. I want to talk about this one for one second. Some people get confused between well, what is barrier removal and what is an alteration? An alteration is is usually part of a much larger scale project. So maybe you've been planning for years. We're going to renovate, you know, the east wing, you know, the the rooms in the east wing or the rooms in the west wing, or you're going to redo the lobby area. An alteration is usually part of a much larger plan. It's it's certainly not something usually it's only dedicated to accessibility. Um, something done to, to modernize the building, to improve the function of the business, or to accommodate a change or growth in services. When you engage in alterations, there's a higher expectation for accessibility. So I think Penny asked the question about the, the door in the bathroom. If you're gunning those rooms, you're going down to the studs, there's going to be an expectation that that door um, should be widened. Much higher expectation than under the barrier removal standard which applies because your building is old. It was built prior to the passage of the ADA and you have to remove barriers that are readily achievable. So there's a much higher expectation as part of planned alteration projects than there is under barrier removal. So I just wanted to, to point that out. Now I'm going to go back. Hopefully. OK. There is a requirement in the ADA standards that when you are when you are doing an alteration project, not barrier removal, but when you're doing a larger alteration project, if you are altering what's known as a primary function area, which is an area where major activities take place. So for a restaurant, a primary function area is is going to be the dining room where people sit and eat. It will not be the kitchen where the cook is is cooking the food. Um, because people don't come to the restaurant to see the cook cooking the food. They go there to, to enjoy a meal you know, with their friends, with their family. Dining room is a primary function area. At a bank, you can actually have a few primary function areas. Of course, the, the teller area, there may be a safety deposit box room. That could be a second primary function area. But the employee bake break room at the bank is not a primary function area. I don't go to the bank as a customer to go to the break room, right? In the case of hotels and motels, a primary function area, of course, first and foremost, is going to be the guest rooms, right? Um, that's why people go uh, to those areas. So guest rooms, and if you have them, things like conference rooms or banquet facilities, those would also be considered primary function areas uh, for most hotels and motels. The ADA tells us that when you're altering a primary function area, like the guest rooms, like the conference rooms or the banquet rooms, you have an additional obligation to provide what's known as a path of travel to those rooms that you are altering. And that path of travel means you have an accessible route that gets people to those, say you're altering guest rooms, um, an accessible route that gets you to the altered guest rooms. And it also includes things like drinking fountains and toilet rooms along that route, if they're provided. Um, and they might not be in, in a hotel situation, or they may be. Um, but if they are, the expectation is that you provide access to those areas. But you're not required to spend more than 20% of your overall construction budget that you had dedicated for the guest room improvements to provide that path of travel. I know someone's going to have a question about this, so I'm happy to entertain it. I want to see if I had another. Let me see here. 
Does anyone have any questions about that? The 20%, the disproportionate cost? No questions? Okay. So, so just be clear, you know, if you're doing the alteration project and you're altering a, a primary function area, you also have this obligation, again, for the path of travel to get someone to those altered areas. You are not required to spend more than 20%, however, of your budget. So that means that maybe you have guest rooms on the second floor, but you don't have an elevator to get people to the second floor. You would not be required to spend more than 20% of what you're spending on the renovation to the rooms on the second floor, which likely means you're not going to be required to put in an elevator unless you're spending a fortune <laughs> uh, such that 20% of that budget um, would be able to afford the installation of an elevator, which is highly unlikely. Um, but that's why that 20% cap is there, so as not to um, force someone to spend uh, more than 20% of their budget um, dedicated towards improving accessibility. And then in alteration projects, there's also recognition that certain barriers are going to be what's known as technically infeasible, meaning you basically, it, there's structural issues that limit you from complying with what would be required in new construction. And real quick, I know this is a question, but this is the actual definition of what technically infeasible is. So it includes, you know, you're renovating a, a hotel room, you want to make that bathroom compliant, but there is existing structural conditions, load bearing members um, that are essential part of the frame, or there's other physical site constraints that won't allow you to comply with what's required in new construction. If that's the case, that's okay. That's why this language is there. You know, the Department of Justice recognizes in, in alterations, it's not always possible. The expectation is that you comply to the maximum extent feasible. And of course, you would document what those conditions were that prevented you from, from providing, you know, what would, what would be required in new construction. Was there a question? Yeah, I have one. Sure. Um, this is one thing that I've always wanted to ask you about because I've run into this a million times too. So the guys are putting up grab bars and they're doing what they can in their bathroom because we're after them to make at least the bathroom accessible, right? Mm -hmm. But then I've seen, I, had a, I have a proper, well, they have a step up into their room. Well, a wheelchair can't go on the steps. So I understand they can make a makeshift, um, what do you call it, ramp. Mm -hmm. But then if we put grab bars and everything in the bathroom and we're calling it an accessible bathroom, but it has a bathtub and not a shower, is that considered an accessible room? Because it's sort of like you started it, but you didn't, you know what I mean? Like I'm thinking a person in a wheelchair. Right. So how does it, how are we able to advertise that this is an ADA room with grab bars and stuff, maybe even the vanity, so you could roll under it, but they can't get in the bathtub. Like, is it or isn't it an accessible room? You know what I mean? That's, well, first of all, if there's a step to get in, it is It is not, <laughs> and I would not advertise it as such. That's just asking for trouble. Um, there are lots of people who, who have other disabilities that don't use wheelchairs that would absolutely still benefit from the use of grab bars, so that's great, um, but, for, for wheelchair users, unless there is some kind of ramp that can be provided, then then no, that's a non-starter. That's definitely not an accessible room. Um, I'm assuming, Penny, your question is referring to a building that was built pre-ADA, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they have not undergone any renovations to the guest rooms? Not renovations, no. Maybe updating with new carpet or thing. No, no renovation. No structural renovation. No structural renovations. Okay. <clears throat> so, so we're clearly in the barrier removal, readily achievable realm. I would say if all of the rooms have one step up to get into them, uh, again, this is something that, depending on the financial resources, you know, uh, of the um of the owner or owners of the building, they would have to evaluate, I don't know how long this hotel has been in business, but this uh, barrier removal obligation has been around for 31 years now. So is it possible to perhaps, and, and do they have the space to do so, to ramp um, whatever the percentage of accessible rooms required is, you know, yeah, face to the can, table? 
I've seen it where they've made wooden ramps. I think my bigger question is what I don't understand is the construction in the bathroom because I'm they're running around. They're worried about having lawsuits right now in the Northeast. So they're putting yeah. grab bars in, right? They're calling yeah. it an accessible bathroom. But if they have a bathtub and not a roll-in shower, is that in your eyes or the ADA's eyes considered an accessible bathroom because it just has grab bars? Well, remember, a certain percentage of rooms are required to have tubs. So not all accessible rooms can you actually are obligated to have tubs and showers. So okay. the fact that it's not a shower does not that that in itself is not make it a problem. Okay. Um, some people actually prefer the tub over the shower. Uh -huh. uh, so that in itself is not the problem. I would say if they are installing grab bars to try to improve access, I hope they're installing them in the correct locations, in the correct height, in compliance with the ADA standards. In terms of what to call them, I'm not going to lie to you, that does get very tricky. Um, and unfortunately, the reason it's tricky is because of a lot of the a, a lot of the complaints that we've seen filed lately. I would be hesitant to use language that said ADA compliant guest rooms. Uh -huh. Um, perhaps the marketing materials indicate that, you know, here are the accessible features that we have on our property and they should be able to explain in, in detail if somebody were to call to try to make a reservation, they, they should be able to explain, you know, our hotel was built in whenever it was built. Um, we have, you know, gone through, um, barrier removal to, to improve certain areas of our property and here's what we've done and here's what we can offer you um and then ex you know be able to explain that so that somebody can make an informed decision as to whether or not what you have will work for them or not okay but i would i, I would i would be really really hesitant to say ada compliant particularly if there's like steps at the rooms well we can say accessible right you can, but I think the safer thing so, to do is is to is to explain what features you have, what yes, features you, you put in place. Yeah. Did you want to say if you, something? If here? you, yeah, if you don't mind me jumping in here, because that's yeah. basically when we're building out our room types, we do call them accessible. But the important thing is uh, to remember, as franchisees, when you give us information on room types, we can only build out the information that you provide us. So if you tell us you have an accessible room, but you don't tell us, you know, that your your doors aren't 32 inches, I believe it is, Jennifer, 32 inches wide minimum. 32 inches clear um, width, yeah. Cl clear width. Um, you know, you don't tell us whether you have a roll-in or you have a bathtub. Like, when it comes to the ADA rooms and us labeling them as accessible rooms, it's really important that you give us all of the information that you possibly can of any available features for that room. And it's important, you know, um, I always tell people, especially when it comes to the website side of things, which Jennifer will be speaking about in one of the future uh, webinars, um, having photographs of that attached yeah. to the proper room type that's built out, you know, um, really gives the person looking to book that room an idea of whether or not that room is going to accommodate their special needs. Um, so if they, you know, if it doesn't have a roll in shower and they see a tub, they're not going to book that room, but at least they were able to identify that they could do that without then having to make phone calls or, you know, trying to find out never different ways or just showing up and realizing, Hey, I can't wheel into this bathroom. They don't have one. So right. it's really important that you provide us the necessary information to build out the room types appropriately for you. And if you have a room type. Uh, one of the other issues is, oh, yeah, yeah, I have a, an accessible room and they send us one type, but they don't tell us that one has a roll in, one has a bathtub. So we technically need to build those out as two different room types, accessible king roll in, accessible king bathtub. Right. That way, our guests are able to identify exactly what type of room they're going to receive when they arrive at your property. So this is going to be my little PSA in here is. If you haven't done that and you don't have accessible rooms listed on your site, um, then reach out to us, fill out the form, reach out to your AMP director and get help on filling that information out because ultimately it's a liability for all of us. It's a liability for us when it comes to the website and it's a liability for you when your guests arrive. So it's really important to make sure that we have the most accurate information out there to help our guests make 
the decisions that they need to make. I'm done. <laughs> no, 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 Gary, that, that's great. Yeah, I, I, I completely, you. completely agree. Um, I know we're, I, I'm running a little behind here. Um, I'm happy to keep entertaining questions, but um, is it okay? Can I have like 10 more minutes or? Take what you want. If anybody needs to drop off the call, they're welcome to. We're going to, it's being recorded, so we will put this out. So if you're going to, if you need to move on to something else, just uh, feel free to pick up the the recording where you left off. But uh, we'd love to have you stay too if you have questions. So. But I, absolutely, Jennifer, I'd like okay. you to finish up. All right, Thanks. thank you. So, uh, and Penny, I think I wanted to take a minute just to kind of talk through a process. Now, this is not a mandated process in the ADA standards or in the ADA regulations, I should say. However, it's something that could potentially be of use to you if you have an older property uh, that was built prior to 1993, and you have not engaged in any, any renovations or alterations, but you want to try to figure out where there are barriers um, as kind of step one. So I have a few tips here um, for barrier removal planning, things that you can consider. Basically, it's it's a mini formula, and it's, it's not rocket science, but <laughs> it might be of use to some of you. So we're going to go through them. Uh, step one would be to conduct an accessibility service survey. And I have a great resource for you on the next slide that I'll share. Um, but that really would be the, the first step. Now, if you are, obviously, if you're engaging, if you're planning on a, a renovation project, at that point in time, you're going to have experts and professionals, design professionals involved in an alteration project. If you're, if this is something you're looking to do more informally, certainly more cost effectively, and you want to do this on your own, uh, there are tools that you can use to in-house try to address what barriers you have, which we can go a long way, you know, particularly for, for barrier removal efforts. Again, larger scale renovation projects, you're going to need the services of, of professionals. But for barrier removal on your own, these are some things you can do. So the second step would be to basically you're going to create a report. Um, and there's no exact formula that you have to use for the report. It's basically a, an area where you're going to note all the barriers to accessibility uh, that you noticed when you were doing the survey. And a great resource, if you haven't seen it yet, um, there's an ADA checklist out there. The website is adachecklist.org. Um, you can go and it's a very, very user-friendly tool that walks you through how to measure, what to measure. Um, and you can use it if you just wanted to informally take a look around your own property and measure the, you know, it shows you how to measure the clear width of a door. You know, the, open the door to a 90 degree angle, measure from the face of the door to the opposing stop. It, 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 it very clearly walks you through um, what you should be me measuring. So you could use this potentially um, to do a checklist and, and a survey of your facility and then note where you have issues that don't comply and put them in that report that was mentioned in, in step two. The third step in barrier removal planning would be to research what you can do to improve those barriers. One really good thing about the checklist that I showed right here is that the checklist itself includes some more common um, improvements. So, you know, it might say if your door doesn't have 32 inches of clear width, one possible remedy, if it works for you, might be to install offset hinges. Um, in some cases, those offset hinges can get you one and a half to one and three quarters uh, additional inches of clear width, um, and they're not expensive. So that's something that you might want to look into. My point is this checklist contains some recommendations for how to improve access where you might notice that, that there's a problem. So. Um, and you can also contact, as I said before, your, your local um, ADA center to see if they have any input for you on what you can do um, to try to improve access at areas that you uh, noted when you did the survey. Step four would be to finalize the barrier removal plan. You want to review it with, um, with any other decision makers that are involved with you. Um, decide which solutions will be best to eliminate barriers at a reasonable cost. And then, because you can't well, usually most people can't fix every barrier at the same time, you're going to want to come up with a way to prioritize those items, you know, figure out what's most important, what can we afford to do first, um, and then make a timeline for carrying out those improvements. 
if it is not readily achievable for you to remove particular barriers, you then want to start thinking creatively, well, what else can we do? If we know we can't physically get rid of this barrier right now, is there another way that we can provide equal access for people with disabilities? For instance, relocating something to another accessible location, providing curbside service. I know in, in terms of staying in the guest room, these might not always work for you, um, but certainly is something that you would want to think through if, if a barrier is not readily achievable, is there another way um, that you could provide access? And this is just... Um, I was just going to ask one quick question of you. Sure. So for those people, you said, let, let's try and find a different way. If, if it's not readily achievable, let's find a different way. Would you suggest to protect themselves in the event of a lawsuit that, that is written as a policy that they share with their staff? Like, say, the front desk doesn't have an accessible lower section, that they write that into their operations policies that if they need somebody who needs assistance that, say, is in a wheelchair, that they take them out to a table on the side and, and complete Correct. the check-in process there? Correct. That's a great example. As okay. Assuming that now that the... the the, oh, I'm sorry. I stepped on my own <laughs> headset. Um, the best thing to do in that case, if it's not readily achievable to lower a portion of the counter, then what you just said, Gary, is exactly what they should do. Okay, but, perfect. But the best solution would be, if, if it's readily achievable, would be to lower a portion of the counter. Gotcha. And, and the point is, though, if they have if they have a policy and a process in place, they should be able to demonstrate that they had that in place if there was ever a suit. Correct, but they would have okay. to also they would have to also prove that it was not readily achievable to lower a portion of the counter. Perfect. So okay. If it was yes. not, then that's absolutely Plan B, and it, it and that policy is wonderful. Right. So Thank what you. I have here is just a one page um, sample of um, back when I was a consultant, I did a million and one accessibility surveys. This is not something you don't have to have a report that looks like this. This is just something to help help you guys visualize what I'm talking about. Um, you start your accessibility survey of your property and you start, you have your clipboard out, your tape measure, your phone, you're taking pictures, you're measuring the, the accessible parking. Well, first of all, hopefully you have accessible parking spaces. So you're gonna measure them, you know, the width, the length, you're gonna look at the signage. Um, and then you just kind of have these uh, columns and rows where you can insert pictures if you need to, which are great. Um, and you're going to follow the checklist and note where there were things that didn't comply. So in this case, they had one accessible parking space. They required to have one. So the recommendation column says no change is necessary. They don't have to do anything. But the signage at the space um, was, was not installed correctly. They weren't mounted high enough. So the recommendation to improve it is, you know, we're going to go and raise the sign so the bottom edge is no lower than 60 inches above grade. And then you're going to have... Uh, an estimated completion date, this timeline. And this is really important. Um, if you do a barrier removal plan, it should be kind of a living, breathing document that you're going to refer to. Again, you can't fix every barrier right away, but something like raising signs um, probably isn't going to take too much time, I would imagine, right, um, to go and have done. So you want to, you know, create this plan indicate how long you think it's going to take you to to eliminate that barrier and then if you need to get a cost estimate you could also um, include those in this barrier re removal plan they also had a curb ramp that had some issues the recommendation of how to correct that curb ramp this is going to be more costly it's going to require um, hiring you know an asphalt company or a contractor to come out so it's going to take you know, probably a little bit more time. So you can see instead of May, we have September filled in there. And then you'd want to get a cost estimate and, and put that there as well. So this is just meant as, as guidance for you. This is not something you have to do, uh, but it certainly can be something useful. And it can be something that helps you stay on target with improving things incrementally over time. It also can serve, since there's been several questions about this, um, as good faith, um, proof of your good faith efforts to improve access. God forbid a complaint is filed. Um, being able to say, this is our barrier removal plan. The, this, this is what we plan on doing. This is our time frame. Be, having a document like this um, would certainly be beneficial if you find yourself in a, in a complaint situation. 
Um, okay, so in, as part of that burial removal planning, you also want to make sure that you maintain all of your documentation. That would include your surveys, your notes, any cost estimates that you received. Um, and then, of course, make the changes. And recommendation would be to um, make sure those changes that you implement do comply with the 2010 standards for design and um, re revisit it. You know, maybe annually you pull it out and just make sure that you are staying on target um, and improving accessibility when you can. And if you can't, updating the plan to reflect why. Now, there will be some, some things, particularly for older buildings. That checklist that I just showed you is based on the 2010 ADA standards for design. Many of your properties might have been built in compliance with the old ADA standard, which was known as ADAG from 1991. I have a checklist for that too. It's at the end of this presentation. Um, if your facility was built under the, you know, in compliance with the old ADA standard, you would want to use that checklist um, because when the new updated ADA standards went into effect, there was recognition that buildings that were built in compliance with the old standards shouldn't be penalized um, because a new set of standards came into effect. So there's what's known as a safe harbor uh, for certain features. So if your building was built in compliance with the old ADA standards, you don't necessarily have to go and make changes until, until you have a planned renovation or an alteration. So one example would be Reach ranges. Everything used to be permitted to be as high as 54 inches. Things like your light switches, any controls that are mounted on the wall. Um, now they're required to be no higher than 48 inches. But if in your property that was built in 1995, everything's at 54 inches, you don't have to go and lower them to 48 um, because of the safe harbor language. Now, if you do go in and replace all the electrical, the wiring, or the plates, then yes, you'd have to lower them to 48 inches. But if you're not doing, certainly if you're not doing any work, um, this is one example of an area that was safe harbored. But the safe harbor that protects facilities that were built in compliance with the old standards does not extend to some features that are rather common um, to hotels and motels, primarily including pools. Um, so if you have a swimming pool, even though it might be very old, um, there's still an obligation because they are not safe harbored. So you'd want to be thinking about how can you provide access into uh, the water there at the swimming pool because, like I said, those are not safe harbored, nor are uh, playgrounds, play areas, or uh, gyms. So if you have like exercise equipment room, uh, there's no safe harbor for those spaces either. So you'd want to be thinking about how you can improve access there. And then, of course, beyond the, the building, um, you also want to think about, again, modifying your policies and procedures. I already, already talked about service animals. Um, are you communicating effectively with people with different types of disabilities? And we're going to talk about that in our October session. We're going to talk about disability etiquette and effective and respectful communication. And we're also going to talk in September about accessible websites and reservation policies. So those are things that we'll get into. Oh. Date TBD, I just told you. <laughs> I think it's September 14th and October 19th at 2 p.m., but you'll get a notice from Gary about those. And here are some additional resources that I think would be used, particularly if you're looking to remove barriers at your site. Uh, these are some of the best resources out there. And the, the bottom of the screen there, the ADA checklist for readily achievable barrier removal for the 1991 standards um, is a great tool to use if you have an older uh, facility. So thank you. I apologize for going over on time, um, but thank you for your questions. I hope this was useful. Um, if you have any questions, um, please do feel free to, to reach out or to contact your local uh, ADA center, and I have their number here for you guys. So thank you. Did you have anything for me, Gary? I think I think I'm good. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and sorry we kept asking so many questions, but no, it was <laughs> I think good. It was, I liked it. It, it was all great stuff. So um, we will be sending this out and you said that you would provide us with the PDF of this presentation. Yes. So when we send the video out, I think we'll include this. That way they have access to all the phone numbers and um, and links so they can just cl click on also. So. Uh, I think it was great, and I look forward to our next one, which is website accessibility and reservations policies. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that's probably going to be our most popular one because that's what 
we are seeing a lot of uh, a lot of lawsuits and stuff coming going on in the industry. So uh, we yeah. look forward to that one. That's awesome. And for that one, um, the primary, I'll be joining, but the primary presenter will be Joe Zeski, who's our program manager. So you'll get to hear someone else's voice uh, besides mine. It'll be a nice change of pace for you guys. <laughs> Wonderful. All Thanks right. So well, much. thank you so much, Jennifer. I appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Penny.